Okay, all right. So I'm Andrew Harding. Um, like Amir mentioned, I'm a, a, a spy. I've been a spy maintainer for a couple of years now, and, and recently I was made a spiffy maintainer. And participated in that um, effort for quite some time. Um, today we're going to have a little bit of a deep dive on, on Spiffy and Spire. Um, and uh, Evan, both Evan and myself are staff engineers at VMware. Uh, I'll let Evan uh, introduce himself, though. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, so I'm Evan. I, I spoke a little bit earlier on the Spiffy update thing. Um, you know, I, I, the goal for today, the goal for this talk is really, you know, that we've got a full day ahead of us. Uh, and we're really only just getting started. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's likely to be kind of a lot of, of, of jargon thrown around and a lot of terms and things like that that might be specific to Spiffy Inspire. And so uh, the goal of this talk is really to kind of familiarize everyone uh, with that and, and do as deep a dive as is necessary, um, we hope as, as is necessary, uh, to, to set folks up to, to really understand and grok the, the presentations for the rest of the day. Um, you know, we also recognize that, that, you know, this might not be new to some of you. We've tried our best to, to make the presentation as interesting as possible. Um, for, for, for those who already may know some of this stuff. And we do have a lot uh, to share with you. Um, so, you know, I hope we don't go too, too far over time here, um, but uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that be that. And um, I'll pass it back to Andrew to walk us through the agenda and kick things off. Okay, so yeah, like Evan said, we're just gonna do a quick overview to help people maybe understand uh, the rest of the talks that are coming today, we're going to start with a quick Spiffy refresher. Uh, they're going to go over the Spiffy Inspire project goals and then dive right into um, how Spire uh, specifically tries to attain those goals through the agent, uh, through nodal Merkle data station, uh, how Spire server manages its keys and rotation strategies, and then we'll talk a little bit about you know deployment and avoiding failure modes. Uh, so right off the bat, um, starting with uh, Spiffy. I did that. There we go. Uh, Kelsey talked about some of these topics, so hopefully this will be a very light refresher. Uh, we're going to start off with the Spiffy ID. Um, again, this is the heart of Spiffy and forms the way that we structure identity for services. And it's a URI, um, and it's it's got a couple of components. The authority component represents uh, the trust domain um, for the identity, and the path component represents you know the particular uh, you know entity identity within that trust domain. Um, and the trust domain uh, is, is in Spiffy nomenclature is, is essentially a namespace um, and uh, provides a, a boundary. So, so trust domain boundaries can, can be along security boundaries. This could be like, you know, different uh, environments like production versus staging um, or even other sort of uh, workloads or systems that you might uh, have some sort of, um, you know, requirement around uh, security isolation for. Uh, it could also just be as simple as an administration administrative boundary like you you've got a couple different teams who want to manage their own independent spiffy um, implementations or deployments and so this could be like you know billing versus sales versus human resources um, and the idea is that trust domains have signing authorities uh, within them and those signing authorities are, are responsible for issuing those secure identities um, for identity within that trust domain and the secure identity uh, inside Spiffy is codified in what's known as the Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document. And this uh, document contains a Spiffy ID and it's again, signed by an authority within the trust domain. And uh, we've got specifications out that define this type of document for both um, X509 certificates and JOT tokens. So we've, we've got our ID, we've got it embedded in, into a, you know, a signed document. Um, now let's talk about how we verify those documents. And we do that with materials that are found in what's called the Spiffy bundle. So again, this is a, a collection of public key material from the authorities for a trust domain. And um, it's used to, to validate SVIDs that belong to that trust domain. Um, if you're reading through like the, the documentation uh, or the specifications, you'll also see this called the trust domain bundle or just trust bundle, these three terms are, are used interchangeably. So uh, building up, now we've got our ID, we've got a signed document over that ID, we can verify it with bundles. Uh, let's talk about how uh, workloads receive this cryptographic material. And that is done through the Spiffy Workload API. So the Spiffy Workload API is, is something that unauthenticated workloads talk to, and again, provides SVIDs and bundle materials um, and streams uh, new materials to the workload as those as those materials change. 
Um, and because it's an authenticated uh, API, uh, in other words, you know, workloads um, don't have to bring some sort of uh, identity with them or, or secret with them in order to authenticate against this API, it solves the secret zero problem for the workloads. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about um, in relation to Spiffy is, is uh, another mechanism uh, to retrieve the bundles for a trust domain, and that is the Federation API. And we've talked about this a few times already today. And again, this is just a very quick way for trust domains to exchange public key material so they can uh, authenticate each other's SVIDs. Uh, it's a, it's a one-way relationship. You know, when you contact this API, you're asserting trust in the bundle material that you pull off that API, but, but it doesn't go the other way around. So you can authenticate their identities uh, but the person you're federating, federating with can't authenticate yours unless they also perform this sort of one-way um, federation step to obtain your public key materials. So in a nutshell, Spiffy gives us cryptographic, verifiable, uh, secret zero solving, um, frequently rotated, federatable, namespaced, uniform identity. And, and that's quite a list, it's huge. Um, and you might be asking yourself, well, you know, you know, maybe maybe all my infrastructure runs inside of a very homogeneous environment where I have, you know, maybe you know, some of these checkboxes checked off, all the ones that are important to me. So, like, what's what's really Spiffy bringing to the table? And so, for Spiffy and, and its project goals, it's not about you know services that are running in a single cloud environment, or maybe this other cloud environment, or that other cloud environment, right? Or or this organization, that organization, or yet another organization or maybe your services that are running bare metal or inside virtual machines um, or in running inside these containerized environments. It's really about uh, an identity substrate that provides all of those benefits that can span all these different environments. So that's it for, for a spiffy recap. Let's talk about Spire now. Um, Spire's whole goal in life uh, as, as, a, as a spiffy implementation, the first spiffy implementation uh, is really to light up that workload API that we talked about that gives you those, uh, you know, bundle and, and SVID materials in as many different uh, environments as possible and to provide a, a sense of uniformity around management of those identities. And it does this um, starting with the Spire agent. This is kind of the, the natural place to start for Spire support of Spiffy because the agent uh, is what lives alongside workloads uh, and implements that workload API and provides those cryptographic materials to workloads in that API. Now, Spire agent itself doesn't, doesn't start out with any of those materials. Um, those materials are centrally managed and signed by the Spire server. The Spire server acts as, as, as the centralized signing authority inside of your trust domain. And so um, there's this, this mechanism through which Spire agent is able to reach out to Spire server and obtain the materials that it will later on feed down to workloads through the workload API. And it caches those materials in an internal cache. And so as, uh, as bundles um, are, are prepared and updated by, you know, inside of your trust domain by Spire server and as SVIDs are minted, um, those are sent down to the Spire agent and cached. And of course, as, as you know, those materials change and rotate, Spire agent is able to reach out and, and continue updating those materials inside of its cache. Um, again, like making those available to workloads downstream via the workload API. Um, you know, now these are these are cryptographically signed identities. These are, you know, and, and they're associated private keys. And so there's, uh, you know, these are security sensitive materials and Spire server isn't just gonna hand them out to anybody. Uh, so there's a process through which uh, Spire agent is able to bootstrap and authenticate against Spire server. And uh, I'll kick it over to Evan to talk about that next. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, so Andrew mentioned that, you know, Spire helps to solve secret zero problem, um, which is, you know, how do you get the first secret? How do you get the first credential? Uh, you, you, you probably don't want to bake it into your workloads or bake it into your nodes and, and deploy them. Um, so, so how do you solve this? Um, ideally at runtime. And uh, so, you know, Spire and Spiffy both look to solve that problem for workloads. Spire in particular, which, which uh, uses this agent, this agent also has to have a solution to the secret zero problem. Um, so when a new agent comes up or a new node comes up online, how do you know uh, the identity of that node or agent? And, and how do you, in order to like in turn authorize the issuance of, of SVIDs to it. Um, so we have this process that is called 
node attestation. And this is a way that Spire server can, can find out the identity of a new agent or a new node without that agent or node having to have had any kind of um, thing baked into it or any kind of pre-existing secret. Um, you can see on the right, there's one uh, node attester plugin for the agent. It is platform specific. Uh, generally. And on the left, you have Spire Server, where it has uh, multiple node tester plugins. So a Spire Server can manage agents across different types of infrastructure. Um, you know, in this example, we have AWS and Google Cloud, as well as a, a bare metal uh, TPM-based tester. Uh, so I'm going to rock you through a couple of examples of how, how this actually works. Um, in the AWS case, uh, the agent tickles this node tester, and, it, and this node tester knows how to reach out and talk to AWS. So in, in this case, we reach out to the AWS metadata service and we grab uh, a document that is signed by AWS that AWS makes available only to uh, this node. And that document has uh, the instance ID and other uh, uh, identity related information um, for this particular node. So. The agent plugin reaches out and, and grabs this thing and then shoots it over to Spire Server uh, under a TLS protected connection. Um, the Spire Server receives this document and, and then passes it down to its uh, node tester that, that pairs with the agent one. And this node tester knows uh, not only how to validate that document that it got from AWS, um, but also to call AWS APIs and perform uh, you know, an, an extra set of validations. Is this a new node? Um, there's some anti-tampering checks that occur there. Uh, you could write whatever logic you, you want in there, really. Um, that's the beauty of this of this pluggable system. Uh, but once the Spire server has effectively been convinced that the agent is running on, you know, instance ID one two three four, for example, um, Spire server will issue the agent its own SVID, and this SVID identifies the agent uniquely within the trust domain, uh, and this this identity that we issue the agent is derived from the the Attestation. So in this case, we issue an identity that's a function of its AWS account number and its AWS instance ID. Uh, and in order to just demonstrate the flexibility of, of, of this node attestation mechanism, I have one more example, uh, which uses a TPM. TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. Um, it's a small little chip that is soldered onto most motherboards these days, and it provides an enclave, uh, if you've heard that term before, a secure enclave for holding private keys and, and making other kinds of security assertions about the state of the hardware. Uh, so there's this node tester TPM, uh, uh, this TPM-based node tester rather, that knows how to reach out to this TPM. And what it can do is it can grab a certificate that is burned into the TPM from its manufacturer. And it sends this certificate over to the Spire server. Um, which is then, of course, passed to the TPM-based uh, node tester on Spire Server. That node tester is configured with this manufacturer CA certificate, so it knows how to validate the certificate, that yes, this is a valid certificate from the TPM manufacturer we expect. Uh, inside that certificate and a, and, a, and a message sent along with it are, are some public keys, and, those and the private keys that are paired with those public keys are actually burned into this TPM hardware. Uh, so what the server does is it, it is then in a position to issue a challenge. So it can take a little knots or a small little randomly generated secret, it encrypts it with this public key that it received, which it now knows to be burned into this TPM by way of the certificate it received, and sends it back to the agent. So the agent receives this challenge and passes it down into its uh, node tester plugin, which then passes it back into the TPM to be solved. Right? So the private key that the TPM is holding on to is able to solve this challenge and send back in clear text uh, the bit of information that Spire Server generated, you can see here. Um, at this point, Spire Server has got a pretty good idea of, of the, the identity of the hardware that this agent is running on. Uh, and, it, and it knows that, you know, the particular key that is, that is burned into this TPM. And same as before, uh, it uses that information to issue an identity to the agent. And in this case, the agent's identity is bound to the identity of this TPM and the hardware that it is running on. So that's that's as fast as I can tell the story of node attestation. The end result here is, is that, you know, we've gone from an agent or a node that just comes up on the network with no prior knowledge to, okay, now we know exactly uh, the identity of this hardware of this agent uh, that we're communicating with. Uh, so that solves the secret zero problem for the agent. Um, but what about the workload? You know, Andrew described that we solve this problem for the workload too via the workload API. So there has to be some, some magic there. And so to solve that, we do a very similar uh, kind of approach in, in Spire Agent that we call workload attestation. 
Uh, so this is able to take a workload that we have no prior knowledge of, that, that it has no credentials and we're able to identify it. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, inside Spire Agent, we have this library called Peer Tracker. Um, Peer Tracker is a platform specific uh, implementation uh, of, of some logic that is able to introspect the kernel that the agent is running on to find out the to find out like which process is calling it. So when the workload calls this workload API, they do all these special lookups and we're able to figure out um, the process ID and some other attributes associated with the process. Uh, once we have this information, we pass the process uh, info back into these workloaded testers, which are similar to, to node testers. Um, one big difference here is that the agent can load multiple workloaded testers and we fan out across all of these. Uh, so in this example, we have you know one for Unix that knows how to talk to the Linux uh, kernel. We have one for Docker that knows how to talk to the Docker daemon. And we have one for Kubernetes that knows how to talk to the kubelet. Uh, so we dispatch each of these plugins and, and they go and they collect information about this process that's calling us and they return what's called selectors. And these selectors describe uh, that calling process. In this case, we have you know, a, a username, we have uh, the SHA sum of the, of the workload binary, we have the Docker image ID and some Kubernetes related information. Um, this is pretty much all, all we need in order to positively identify uh, this workload. What is the, the shape of this workload exactly? What is the identity? Now we are in a position where we can issue it an SVID, a key, uh, um, and the associated, the associated bundle. So we spent a lot of time so far talking kind of about uh, the agent, how the agent gets an identity, how the agent issues identity to workloads. Um, but of course, there's the server component that Andrew mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it, it's got to manage these keys. It's got to actually mint these SVs. It's got a bunch of responsibilities on its shoulder. Uh, so I'll pass it back to Andrew to take a look at some of those internals. Thanks, Evan. All right, so uh, again, Spire serves the centralized signing authority for SVIDs inside the trust domain. And uh, it accomplishes this by having a signing authority for each uh, SVID type. So that inside Spire server, there's a distinct authority for uh, X509 and JOT SVIDs. Um, now these uh, pairs here, uh, the X509 authority is represented as an X509 CA certificate and it's a company private key. Um, this, this CA certificate uh, can be self-signed uh, it can also uh, belong to a larger uh, existing PKI scheme and be signed by, by an authority inside that existing PKI. Uh, the JOT authority uh, is just a simple asymmetric key pair, um, you know, and it's in charge of signing the JOT SFIDs. And uh, one thing to note here is that across these two, uh, you know, authorities, uh, the private key material is not directly managed by Spire server itself. And this is a security consideration to kind of separate out the private key management from Spire server itself and, and offload that uh, to what is known as the key manager plugin. Uh, the key manager plugin is a, a simple uh, interface that is uh, more or less loosely based off of uh, a subset of PKCS 11. And through this interface, uh, Spire server manages a multiple key slots um, for private keys uh, and can create these keys and use, uh, you know, use these key slots to uh, sign arbitrary data. Um, there are a, a couple of uh, key manager plugins that are built into Spire. Um, the top two you see there, memory and disk. Um, we've touched on this earlier when Augustine gave his update um, that there are uh, community efforts in place to develop a TPM based key manager. Um, as well as uh, something that hits AWS's uh, key management servers. Uh, getting back, um, we, we talked just a second ago about how the X519 authority um, can be part of a larger existing PKI. And the way that that's accomplished inside Spire is through the use of an, well, Evan, I think we just- Let's lost. see, yep, sorry, hold on. <laughs> I got kicked out of my, SSO session right in the middle of our presentation. One second. Is that better? Uh, I have my side. I, I need to share. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Virtual conferencing at its finest. Yes, yes. Sorry, everyone. Hey, it's real time and it's interactive. Beats pre-recorded. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, where's my mouse? Let's see. Okay, is that better? All right, I'm back. Perfect. Thank okay. you. All right, so uh, the way that Spire accomplishes interacting with this, you know, sort of existing upstream PKI um, is through the upstream authority plugin. And again, this is a very simple interface that just provides enough functionality uh, for Aspire to interact with that upstream PKI for the, the two different authority types that it manages. Um, specifically, uh, as the next 509 authority is prepared, uh, the CSR for that uh, intermediate CA certificate that Spire wants to be signed uh, is sent upstream through the Mint X509 CA RPC, uh, where it is signed by the upstream authority and, and then shipped back. Uh, and if we want to talk about JOT, uh, as the JOT authority is prepared, the public key material is published upstream uh, again through the upstream authority uh, published JOT key RPC. And the idea here is that uh, mechanisms inside that upstream PKI can then disseminate that key uh, to interested parties who want to validate JOT as bits minted by this particular Spire server instance. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of upstream CA implementations here. Um, I won't go over uh, most of these, um, but I will mention this last one, the Spire Upstream Authority plugin. Um, Evan's gonna dive into the details of this later, uh, but this is essentially where Spire is acting as the upstream authority for a, a downstream Spire server. And it enables some, some interesting um, resiliency uh, and um, isolation benefits. Um, so again, we've talked about how these authorities, you know, are prepared and maybe participating inside of uh, an, uh, an upstream PKI, uh, but we haven't really talked about how the public key material from these authorities makes its way back to agents and down through the workloads um, via the workload API. And so uh, essentially what happens is, is Spire manages a storage backend. Um, and this is known as the data store and it, it's involved in, in storing all sorts of different things, uh, which we won't get into now. We're mostly concerned at this point with the trust bundle for the for the trust domain. Um, as these authorities are prepared, the public key material uh, is appended to the bundle inside the data store. And uh, like we talked about way back uh, when we first introduced the Spire agent, um, you know, the Spire agent is, is uh, you know, at some frequency connecting to the server and synchronizing down uh, bundle material and, and getting, you know, SVID signed and rotated. And so as part of that synchronization process, we can see that you know, it, it pulls the bundle uh, from the data store and directly through the Spire, Spire server. And as the uh, X509 and JOT authorities are rotated, again, those, the new public key material is appended to that bundle inside the data store um, you know, over and over uh, as, as you know, Spire lives and, and, and breathes and, and does its, its rotation um, strategy. And you know, again, those, those materials are periodically pulled from uh, the data store through the Spire server down to the, to the Spire agent and out to the workloads. Now, there's, uh, you know, this, this rotation of X509 and JOT authorities, this happens at a configurable cadence. Um, and we've, you know, we've, we've seen how, how the public key material from those, uh, you know, newly prepared authorities is, is, you know, stuffed into outside the data store and eventually makes its way down to, to agents. Um, but there's a, because the, the agent is not getting a continuous stream of updates and is, is kind of pulling in at some frequency, there's an interval in which, uh, you know, an X509 authority has, has been prepared and it's public key material has been published to the data store, but where an agent has yet to pull that data store for that key material. And so at that point, uh, you can imagine that if that newly prepared authority was immediately start to, uh, immediately uh, assigned to, to start minting SVIDs, that if those SVIDs made their way to an agent who has yet to pull uh, for that bundle update, uh, the agent would be unable to verify those SVIDs. And so um, Spire implements an interesting rotation strategy to kind of uh, prevent this and, and mitigate this situation. And it accomplishes this um, by actually having two authorities per SVID type. So I, I lied a little bit in, early in the presentation. Um, the first set of authorities is considered the active um, set. And the active set um, sits alongside the prepared set. Uh, and the active set is the one who, that is involved in signing the SVIDs. So, so any authority that's, that's in that active slot is the authority that's chosen to sign incoming SVID requests. 
and of course it's public key material exists in the data store and, and is propagated out to agents as they sync. And uh, you know, at some point, um, you know, maybe these authorities are, are gonna retire uh, somewhat soon. Um, you know, Inspire's gonna decide it needs to rotate in a new authority key pair uh, for both the X509 and JOT authorities. Uh, but when it does so, it, it doesn't just replace the active authorities. Instead, it prepares uh, a new set of authorities in advance and sticks those in the prepared slot. And during this time, you know, of course, uh, the, the public key material is added to the bundle and, uh, you know, the active slot is still uh, the one in charge of minting these different identities. And so there's an interval in, of time here where uh, our active slot is minting identities and our prepared slot um, has been prepared and it's public key material placed in the bundle where it's now propagating down to agents in advance of it ever being used uh, to sign SVIDs. So after you know, ample time has elapsed that has allowed that the public key material for the newly prepared authorities to, to propagate throughout the system and make its way all the way down through agents and into workloads, uh, that active key pair can then be retired. Now the bundle material stays the same. We don't prune out the old uh, authority key material quite yet. Um, we wanna leave it in there for a bit of time because there could still be, uh, first of all, the rotation event happens or the activation step happens before that old authority has, has actually expired. Um, and so there, there could still be SVIDs floating around inside your system that have been signed with that old re now retired authority uh, that you'd still need to validate. So we, we give some time before we end up pruning that key material out of the bundle. Um, and again, this, this process is repeated uh, as Spire continuously monitors and rotates these authorities to, to maintain you know, freshly rotated um, authority material. Uh, the cadence that we do this at um, is it's a pretty simple strategy uh, it's based on how much time is left on the active authority. Uh, so when the active authority has half of its lifetime left, that's when we go ahead and prepare a new authority. And then when the active authority has one sixth of its lifetime left, that's when we go ahead and activate the new authority. And you can imagine, uh, you know, a, a space of time between that halfway mark and that one sixth mark. That is the time that we give uh, that uh, prepared bundle material to propagate out to the, to the uh, you know, trust domain before we start minting SVIDs with the, the newly prepared authority. And there's some, some caps in there to like prevent, prevent uh, some weird times with, with really long lived authorities. Um, but I, I'm happy to talk about that. I won't take the time to uh, talk about that right now. Um, let's see. So We've talked a lot about you know, Spire, Spire's uh, responsibilities, Spire server's responsibilities in particular. It's, it's doing a lot of different things. It's signing SVIDs, it's rotating authorities, it's publishing stuff upstream. And it's obviously a big, a big point of failure. If something goes wrong with Spire server, that has large implications on, on, the, you know, on our ability to, put, to push identity out to our workloads. Um, so Evan next is going to talk about, um, Sorry, I'm messing around with slides here. Evan's gonna to take a minute to talk about um, you know, some deployment strategies for Aspire to try and mitigate those failure modes. Thanks, Andrew. I'm gonna um, speed through this as fast as possible because we're already well over our, our allotted time here. Um, so you know, th this is kind of the, the, the simplest deployment we can imagine, right? And as Andrew mentioned, Aspire server becoming unavailable is, is particularly problematic if all the workloads are depending on having valid SVIDs to communicate with each other. Um, the good news is that there, this is not the, the most terrible thing in the world if the Spire server were to fail. I mean, it's not ideal, um, but you know, Andrew mentioned previously that the Spire agent does have a cache and the agent knows what, what identities it can issue and it fetches those in advance and it caches them. So the Spire server goes away, um, you know, we can't get new SVIDs, we can't rotate expiring SVIDs, but the agent can still perform workload attestation and can still serve SVIDs to workloads um, from its cache without contacting the server. So. You know, it, it's survivable in a steady state, but again, it's not ideal. Um, the, the, the very simple kind of, of approach to, to addressing this is to scale the Spire servers horizontally. Um, you can have as many of them as you like, That this obviously addresses performance issues as well. Um, we don't have any, any notion of active or passive. Each server, um, you know, has the full authority. And, 
they do have kind of a shared a shared data store though. Um, if you were to say, hey, I want to put one of these in each in like different failure domains, like one in each region or one in each availability zone or something, um, you know, having this to, to stripe a data store across those things is, is not ideal. And so another tool we have in our tool chest um, is what we call nested Spire. I've had a couple mentions of it today. Um, this is where Spire uses another Spire server as its upstream authority. Um, downstream Spire servers do node attestation and workload attestation, the same as a regular uh, workload does. So you could have, for instance, one Spire server in AWS and, and, and another Spire server in Azure, and both of them kind of roll up to this global uh, root level. Um, so this allows you um, to scale across these different failure domains and to manage the failure of, of you know, different tiers of, of Spire servers. So if this global kind of tier were to go away for some reason, you know, the local Spire servers can still perform signing operations, can still rotate workload estimates. Uh, they cannot rotate their own signing uh, keys, like their JOT keys or CA certificates. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we look to the upstream servers for. But, uh, you know, you can imagine if you have a one week lifetime on those or a two week lifetime on those, you've got a significant amount of time uh, to, to get that central kind of cluster back up and running. The final tool we have in our tool trust is Federation. Um, you know, this is where we have a different set of Spire servers that is in a completely different trust domain as a completely different uh, set of authorities. Um, and then the Spire servers between each other, they, they exchange public keys. Um, this is good for managing failure domains. It's also good for managing uh, security domains. If the Spire server and trust domain bar on the right hand side here uh, were to go down, it does not affect identity issuance and trust domain foo. Uh, if it were to be compromised, it also doesn't affect uh, security of identity issuance and trust domain foo. Um, so in summary, very quickly, um, we learned about all these major kind of Spire code paths. This is all the, the major works that, that are really important to understand like how, how Spire works under the covers. And we learned particularly about node and workload attestation with Spire, how we go from not knowing who anything is to knowing who th what things are. Uh, we learned about key management and rotation um, how all of that is managed by Spire server and, and how Spire agent receives those and, and figures out which workloads to give them to. And we also learned about some of the Spire fail failure modes and different deployment patterns and, and techniques that you can use to mitigate uh, some of the concerns that come up with this, with this kind of technology. If you wanna learn more, you can check out the Spiffy website at spiffy.io. Um, we also, these are the two uh, main GitHub repos, uh, Spiffy and Spire GitHub repos. Uh, we also have our, our Slack channel, a very welcoming community. So we, we hope to see you there. Um, I know we're, we're already very much over time. So uh, we'll take questions in the chat. Uh, I'll be there and Andrew will be there to answer them async. And uh, we also have a session later today, a networking session in which we can, um, you know, kind of talk about any, anything that, that might've come to mind during this presentation. Uh, so thank you for bearing with us in this, <laughs> in this much longer than planned uh, uh, talk. And we really, really hope that um, it's helped to kind of set the stage for the rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.